What's up everyone, True Techno Gamer here, and this is my end of 2023 kind of wrap up. Um, I wanted to follow up on the home theater tour video that I just put out. And first of all, I wanna thank you guys so, so much. Um, that video has been uh, a hit. It's one of the best videos on my channel thus far. Um, the last video I did for the home theater tour two years ago was one of the most popular videos. So I'm glad you guys liked it. Lots of great comments. Um, I think I'm already well over 5,000 views. It's been just about a week. Um, so that's awesome, awesome. So I appreciate it. Um, thanks for checking it out. Thanks for the love and let's keep it going, all right? So um, in the video, I posed the question, you know, have I reached my end game, right? This channel has been about my journey to end game and the journey is really the fun part of it, of course. But have I reached it? You know, am I there? Um, am I truly satisfied? That was a question that I got in the comments um, and I thought it would be worthwhile to try to answer it um, as effectively as possible. So I will get into that and touch on some lessons I learned um, in terms of getting all of this new equipment and the, the core kind of like components of the home theater part. Um, and then um, are there other areas that maybe I haven't reached in game? You know, where else would I go from here? In other words, right? So I'm gonna touch on all of that um, for this video. Please like, subscribe to the channel, like the video, give me more comments. You Hopefully you guys have seen I respond. I definitely look at and try to respond to just about every comment I get on here. So um, please keep that going. All right, so um, have I reached my end game? Uh, you know, the short answer is, you know, I, in this space, and I'll stress that in this space, I feel like I pretty much have, right? Now, when I think about that answer and think about that question, right, it's, it's important to describe what end game really means to me. What do I mean by end game? Because I've seen some folks are like, come on, man, you never hit end game, right? There's no such thing as end game, right? Um, you know, this, it never stops, whatever, and especially with technology, whether it's home audio and home theater and uh, computer graphics and games, cars, whatever you want to throw at it, it, it just never stops, right? Because there's no ultimate you know, ultimate perfect product, right? There's no ultimate perfect speaker. There's no ultimate perfect television, et cetera, et cetera. But I would submit that, you know, end game is relative, right? In other words, one person's end game may not be someone else's end game, okay? And that's important for you to understand what's important for you. What are the things that you want and the things that you need? What is your budget, you know? Um, and then what's obtainable, where, you know, where does the value proposition really end for you? Okay. So I'm going to talk about what it means for me, because I've thought about this at length and, um, you know, it may match yours in terms of your overall like description and look of it or not. Right. But, um, you know, for me, this is what it means. This is what works. So, you know, first I look at end game as the point where, um, I'm really hitting diminishing returns in terms of objective performance. Uh, for whatever that product is or whatever that does. So, you know, it doesn't mean that it's the perfect speaker or the best speaker or the best subwoofer, or, right? Or perfect TV. Uh, it just means that, you know, in my estimation, you know, anywhere I would go above that financially in terms of costs or, you know, size or whatever, or just up the line, so to speak, um, anywhere I would go from there, um, it really becomes more about subjectivity and preference you know, than actual objective performance, right? It takes diminishing returns, not no returns, but diminishing returns. So you get to a certain point where it just, you're, you know, it's the nitpicks, it's the little finest details now that may be a little bit different between one one um, product and the other product, right? Um, but it really, it's just more about, well, what do you like? You know, what looks better to you? What fits your room better? What works better with your other components, if it's a speaker or whatever? That's what it's more about as opposed to, this product can do this that my current product just simply cannot do at all, right? Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's not as much about that. So there is a diminishing return. And I had this shootout for speakers in particular um, on my channel where I, where I, you know, auditioned um, a bunch of 5000 or $10,000 plus speakers. And in that, you know, um, I basically concluded exactly what I'm saying is that, you know, there was a, you know, Bowles and Wilkins and Paradigm and Acura Acoustics, um, Magico, right? Vocal, great, great speaker companies, reputable names and brands. And I concluded that they really all sounded great, pretty great. 
It wasn't a dramatic difference in my estimation between any of them. So my conclusion was that, yeah, you can't really go wrong from just a pure sound quality perspective. You can't really go wrong with any of them. They did sound a little bit different, had different signatures, but again, that's more of a preference. It wasn't that one just wowed me more than the others. Um, and that's kind of what I mean. To me, that's kind of what's representative and indicative of Endgame. You know, when I ask myself, where do I go from here? Like legitimately, you know, like I pointed out in my tour, I'm pretty much at the flagship for these companies that I have gravitated towards for different reasons, whatever reasons that I have for me. But over a 20 year span, I have gravitated towards Paradigm, Anthem, Parasound, right? Um, LG for TVs, right? For a reason. And I'm at their flagship. There, there really is nowhere else to go from an AVM90, from a JC5, unless I go monoblock or something. That's a whole nother conversation, you know, from a paradigm persona, right? Um, so when I ask myself, where do I go from here and I can't get myself an obvious answer, then I'm pretty much at endgame, right? Um, when I look at it and it's like, well, yeah, that speaker, you know, looks better, is bigger, is smaller, is, is more aesthetically pleasing. It has this number of drivers or this size driver that, you know, it has, has a little bit better balance to me, you know, but it's not like, oh my gosh, like, whoo, this is a whole nother level. The personas are a whole nother level from, you know, the monitors for sure, or even the founders, I would say. But, you know, I wouldn't say that the Bowers and Wilkins Diamonds are a whole nother level from a Focal Sopra, for example, or the Focal Utopia versus like the Magical S series, it's just, it was just worlds apart. No, they sound different, but they're generally the same objective level of sound quality, but they, they're gonna sound different and have different things that appeal to different people based on their own ears, all right? So that's what in-game is to me. Now the key here is, and a lot of people are probably already listening and thinking like, again, it don't, you know, it don't stop, right? This stuff doesn't stop. And I get where that's coming from, all right? In-game doesn't mean that you never buy another product. Okay, it just it, to me it just means that things at that point are just more lateral again based on preference, not so much going up this this proverbial ladder. Um, but it's important to know, like I said, for you, what is important to you? What do you want? What's in your budget? What are your priorities? What do you value? And that's the journey that I've been on. That's what I've been chronicling in this channel. So when you see the videos, you hear me talk about me being at all of these high end audio shows at CAF and, Ex and Exponia, right? Uh, Capital Audio Fest and Exponia, Chicago, and go to all of these dealers. I've done these shootouts, right? At different dealers and boutiques. And this what I've been doing, you know, for the past, gosh, 10 plus years, really, but definitely, definitely in earnest in the past like five years. Why have I been doing that? Why I have been doing that is because I'm trying to give myself the full, complete picture, the full lay of the land, okay? Because when I know everything that's out there, that's possible for audio, for a speaker, for an amplifier, for a processor. It doesn't mean I've heard every single thing, of course, no one has. There's so many products out there. But I have heard what a million dollar speaker sounds like, right? And a million dollar system sounds like, two channel system. I do know what $300,000 speakers look like and sound like, as well as know what $500 speakers look like and sound like now, right? I do know what a $50,000 amplifier, right? That weighs over 250 pounds, sounds like, right? I know that now, right? I know what a, you know, $20,000 subwoofer can sound like, right? So that's why I've been doing that because now that I have the full lay of the land and I know it's possible, I can now define for me, you know, where my point of diminishing returns are and where my point of, uh, end game status is in terms of it not being much value beyond that point, right? Doesn't mean that it's, again, not different, that there's no return, but the value proposition isn't there after a certain point for me. And I, and I kind of identify what that point is. Knowing everything, the perspective matters, the budget matters. So quick story for you guys, when I was first coming into this, I'm not going to give you the full, full story, but when I first was coming into this, my perspective on audio went from, you know, my mom's Kenwood, you know, just two channel, you know, stereo system from the, from the late 80s or early 90s, somewhere around there, right? And knowing what that sounded like and what I would do as a kid was just always just turn the trouble all the way up, all the way up, max it out because, right, silly now. Uh, but that's what <laughs> I thought sounded good, right? Clear, 
clarity, um, super bright, of course. Um, and then, you know, for me personally, I went from that to having one of those Iowa boom boxes. Remember back in the day, those like big Iowa gray, usually were gray, I speak is about this big kind of bookshelves um, with all of like flashy lights and stuff, the blue lights and whatever. That was like my first kind of stereo that I had like in my room. And I thought it sounded amazing. The speakers, like I thought it could, you know, was loud for my room and all of that stuff. Um, and I went from there to, you know, um, thinking that I can use that for a home theater, right? When my mom moves into a home and I was still in high school and I was like, oh man, I'm going to took my, my, cause I had one that had the little, the little surround speakers. I had a 5.1 version of that. And I took that. I was like, yeah, you know, these, these speakers, again, $200 thing. Um, great. And I put it into the home theater and tried to watch a movie on DVD at the time, which was pretty new. And basically I blew it out. Right. Because uh, it wasn't able to fill up that room. It could fill up my little bed, like my room, but not this full like basement. It was like in a basement area of the house. Couldn't fill it up. And, and I turned it up. It was flashing. And I'm like, well, I can't even hear it. Why is it flashing? I just kind of crept it up, crept it up and phew, right. Blew it up. <laughs> so that was my perspective there. At that time, high end to me and what I thought was like the end game, so to speak, I mean, the next thing I got was a Polk Audio satellite system. Remember those little tiny speakers about this big, right? Um, with a receiver and a sub, right? So an actual 5.1 system. That was my first entry into it. And I thought it sounded amazing. And I thought it sounded pretty pretty darn close to what a movie theater would sound like. Um, but, you know, little tiny satellites, right? And I saw that Polk had these towers. And I remember Polk had like these, you know, their entry level towers, uh, which were like the RTI series, which I wound up getting soon, but basically they were like that they started at like seven hundred dollars and they went up to like fifteen hundred dollars. And then they had like a their flagship, which was the Polk LSI speakers, if you remember that. Um, and those speakers were like twenty five hundred dollars. And I remember thinking at the time that those speakers, those LSI speakers with the ring radiator tweeter for twenty five hundred dollars was just like blowing my mind, first of all, that anyone would buy a speaker for twenty five hundred dollars, first of all, right? And then that that would actually like I mean, like, there would be even any way to justify that. Like, that just seemed like it was so far over the top and so far beyond. Like, $2,500 speakers, they got to, like, sound amazing. They got to blow your mind. Like, there could be nothing in the world better than that. I had no idea at the time that there were speakers out there that cost $10,000, $20,000. You know, at least not in any practical way. Um, and I didn't know what that could get you. I, I couldn't imagine that, right? So then the Polk LSI level was my end game. Right. That's what I'm saying. That's the same. Now, now, that was 20 years ago. Right. So 20 years later, after listening to all the stuff, after having a bunch of things in my home and graduating my, my own speakers and stuff like that, I now see, you know, get to point like with these beauties. Um, and I know what that gets me. So the value proposition is now there in my mind because I've heard what these can do over what my previous speakers can do. And I've also heard what speakers cost in three, four times the amount of money of these can do. Right. And I'm not saying, again, that there's nothing there and that they're, they're not better at all. Or these are the best speakers in the world. No. But for me, I don't I can't justify what what comes with those extra speakers over something like this. Right. Um, or what comes with the extra amplifier over something like a JC5 over what comes from, you know, getting a more expensive amp uh, processor, sorry, over the AVM90. You know, um, for my use case, for my life right now, for this space, as I said, I just don't feel like I need more than this. Now, a lot of that also has to do with discipline. It's discipline, guys. I know people, and some of you guys are watching, I know people that just cannot help themselves. They got to go and buy a new graphics card every year. They got to go and buy a new, you know, car, at least a new car, or buy a new car every other year. They got to go get a new TV every year to try to get the new flagship or whatever. Even when they barely change them year to year, they got to get a new iPhone, a new smartphone every year. You guys, you guys are out there, right? I'm talking to you guys. I've never been about that. I've never been about that. I'm too practical and I'm also too driven by the value prop. Like, I have to know what I'm getting. What am I getting out of this? When I got this TV, for example, it's an OLED. I had an OLED before. OLED technology fundamentally for a while, until fairly recently, hasn't the picture quality hasn't changed much. It still looks tremendous. My first OLED was from 2016. It looked the same as the one I got from 2018, which looked pretty similar to this one from 2022, picture quality-wise. 
What I was getting with this, besides the extra side, because they didn't have 83 inch uh, OLEDs back, back then, was also, like I said, the HDMI 2.1, which added a whole bunch of gaming features. And I'm a big gamer. So now, that's what justified it, you know. And then, yes, it also, this particular TV was a noticeable improvement over previous OLEDs, even from LG, because they added the heat sink and it was brighter. It hit a thousand nits for the first time ever, blah, blah, blah. So that was a good milestone kind of point to go into. But I was, I'm, I'm getting so much out of it from, from the features and the gaming aspect of it, especially, um, that it was justified. For example, right? Um, I got to know what I'm getting, guys, you know? I work in the, the PC gaming industry. I have been working in the PC gaming industry now for over a decade. And my personal PC is like seven years old. You know, I that I that I built again seven years ago with the quad core, you know, <laughs> like Intel processor from 2015 and uh uh NVIDIA 1080. Like that's my personal PC to this day. Because I just you know I don't game on my PC at nearly as much. And I don't feel compelled to um, because when I upgrade my PC, I want it to be something where I feel like I'm getting an experience that is noticeably above not only what my current PC does, because but also for so much money. Also, in a way, some way beyond what I can get here in this theater set up with a PS5, right? And, you know, that has to be clear to me. This is what this is above and beyond that. So if that's not clear to me, I'm not paying it. I'm not buying the money. Seven years sitting on that PC. The speakers I had before these, I mentioned 15 years. I got those speakers in 20, uh, 2008. Okay, it's 2023. I just got these. 15 years I've been sitting on my speakers, right? So I'm not out there. You know, there was a lot of speakers on the way. I've been looking potentially to upgrade or started looking at the upgrade probably as early as 2012. 2012, I've been going to sort of like, oh, I wonder. But nothing grabbed me. Nothing said, you know what? This is worth it. This is what you need to do, right? Until now. Um, I have a TV in my house. I love OLED. I, I, I've been clear, OLED or die. But I have a TV in my house that is older than, than the older speaker that I got in 2007. Why? Because it's in a guest room that, you know, doesn't get daily use, doesn't get weekly use. It's only used for when we have family and friends coming through. And, you know, it doesn't need to be have all the smart stuff. It doesn't need to have OLED. Why? We're barely watching it, right? It was a high-end TV at the time, but it still works. Right, like, right, you know, no, no need to go crazy and be, you know, and just upgrading stuff just for the sake of upgrading. I've never been about that, so it has to be justified. It has to be a real value that I see out of it. That's a discipline thing. So I'm not gonna just be going throwing money, you know, like money grows up a tree to everything. Okay, so for me, that's what I think about when I think of end game. Now, there are many lessons that I learned along the way in getting to this point. Like right? going along that journey. Um, that are is, is just cool, and I want to share with you guys because I think it's cool learnings. But it also feeds into, you know, what again the answer of am I truly satisfied and have I reached the end game? It's just knowing a lot, learning a lot of this stuff, which you don't really get until you get stuff in your hands, right? So, for example, when you get speakers of uh, quality like this, a lot, a big part of it is that these speakers are so transparent, they're so detailed that sound. Coming out of them sounds different. It sounds different than what you might be used to on your AirPods or your sound bar, you know, your Bluetooth speaker, right? Or your TV speakers it, it, or your car, right? It doesn't sound like that. One of the dealers that I that I talked to a lot through this journey um, in, my, in my local area here, uh, I remember when I was talking about this, this, this level, Persona, you know, Focals, um, Revel, you know, per, per listen, right? These kind of things. He said, he's like, look, when you get speakers like this, you're not going to want to listen to some of the your favorite songs, right, that you're used to on these speakers. You want to leave those songs to the car. That's how you put it, right? And and leave your system for the stuff that really sounds good and really matters. Um, and what he was saying is, yeah, a lot of pop songs, a lot of hip hop songs in a way, you know, they're not recorded and mastered in a way that is going to sound good with speakers that are this transparent. Transparency means that the sound is going to come out the way it came in. That's what the speaker's job is to do. That's good and bad. If bad stuff came in, bad stuff is going to come out. So when you have a horrible recording, but they're using a lot of synthetic instrumentation and synthetic sounds, it's not going to sound magical just because the speaker costs a certain amount of money or has beryllium tweeter or beryllium mid-range and whatever else technology-wise. 
engineering wise, it doesn't matter. Um, so that's important. And what I was learning was, and, and you know, six months in, I'm, and I'm still learning that because I'm still listening to certain things, certain sources where I'm like, wow, you know, <laughs> like, um, either I hear the difference. I can hear the differences in so much with these speakers. So many little things. I can hear the difference from high res versus non high res, from streaming versus disc, from, you know, compressed stuff versus non compressed stuff. Like it's all there, right? And it's all noticeable. Um, but it does change like the character of some of your sound. And it's not evident right away that it's better. It's just different. And then once you kind of really delve into it, you realize, wow, like it actually is better. And this is like, in terms of it being closer to what the truth, truth the truth is, right? Kind of more closer to what the studio intended. Um, that takes time and it still takes time. So just understand that when you get a, a system like this, it's not like you just throw everything at it and everything sounds like magic. You throw that, Horrible, you know, uh, it's like throwing a DVD, right, on a 4K TV or something, right? Like, you know, it can only do so much upscaling, right? So just keep that in mind. That was a huge learning experience. Um, I just recently been experimenting with the Blue Sound Node, and I, I spent most of my time listening to music through the Blue Sound Node um, and pumping out the high res songs. And I had a digital optical cable hooked up to it, guys. And um, that this goes back years. I have a, you know, like a, in my closet, a bunch of old cables from over the years, digital optical, digital coaxial, that kind of stuff. And I had optical because I remember years, years, years ago with just like CD, uh, I was always kind of told or led to believe that it really were, they were really interchangeable in terms of like the ultimate feature set and resolution and detail, and whatever. Um, but optical, people who said optical in general was preferred and kind of sounded better. So I just kind of got in the habit of using optical. And I'm streaming out high res, and I'm noticing that as it gets to my uh, my processor here, um, I'm getting like 96 kilohertz, 24 bit, you know, resolution. But there's some files on Cobos and Title that are beyond that, and are 24 bit, 192. And when I was trying to do that, I wasn't getting the 192 in here. And then I realized, because I looked up <laughs> at the time that some of you guys probably know this, but you know, this is kind of stuff that you don't really think about. I realized that. With, di with optical cables, you can only get up to 2496. You can't get 2492, it doesn't have the bandwidth. But a digital coaxial cable does. Whoa, didn't know that. So I hooked up the digital coaxial cable like a few weeks ago, and now you know, I can get the full full res from some of these streaming sources. And you know, it's again, it's cool, it's a revelation. You know, So now that changed how I'm listening to some of these songs and how I would evaluate the overall system for the better, of course, right? Um, Another uh, key thing I got to share with you guys with the Parasound JC5. So I initially got, you know, I had some issue where I had to take the JC5 back that I initially had because um, I had an issue. I'll go into that in another video. Um, but when I got the new one and I was hooking it up, uh, I have the Panamax. You guys have seen I have this Panamax power conditioner here. And by default, I got the power conditioner to do that, to clean up the power. Um, and that was happening because I was noticing this hum, this kind of faint hum, buzz, sound, you guys know, that was coming in when the system was on, but there was no sound. I can hear it through my speakers, not these speakers, but the speakers I had at the time. I can hear them, and it's like this, zzz, right? And I'm like, man, it sounds horrible. It was really noticeable. It was really starting to bug me. So I looked that up, looked into that. Okay, I probably should invest in a power conditioner. I started plugging everything into the power conditioner, which is to clean up the power and also to be a, a you know a pretty robust surge protector. At the time, I had an Emotiva amp, right? So I plugged that in. Then I got the Parasound A21, and I plugged it into there. So when I got the JC5, guess what? I had it plugged into that as well. Well, you guys probably know where I'm going with this, right? The JC5 is a beast of an amp, right? It's rated at 400 watts into eight arm resistance, um, 600 watts times two into four arm resistance. These speakers generally are four to six arms. So they're probably pulling, pulling 600 watts, up to 600 watts easily out of this thing. And, you know, they can do that. And they can output, you know, again, over a thousand watts in, in, in a bridge, you know, format. So this is a lot of power. Um, but more than just the wattage, it's a lot of current, right? And that's one of the things I love about Paris Town is that they built their amps around having high current. And they put the current ratings. This thing is rated at 90 amps, amperage. Right, 90 amps of current per channel. Okay, that's a lot. Okay, so what happens is 
the Panamax has high current, a high current bank of outputs in there. They call it high current. In the documentation, it says this is for your high power devices, such as your subwoofers with their built-in amps and your amplifiers. It says that. So I'm like, okay, right? So when I, like I said, I had an Emotiva, I had whatever amp, I plugged it into there to the high current, you know, bank and was listening to that for years, right? For the last, however long I had this thing, probably seven, six, seven years. Um, probably more than that, probably seven, eight years now, right? So fine. Now I get to the JC5, which is this nice beast of a flagship audiophile amp, right? Plug it into there and been listening, didn't know any better. When I first got the first one, I had to take it back. And when I got the second one, when I was hooking it up, something told me, I don't know what, but something that was like, wait a minute, let me just try to plug it into the wall. I think basically I was just trying to test it to make sure I didn't have the same issue that I had on the other one. So I wanted to just throw it into the wall before I got it all, you know, wired up. And guys, I plugged it into the wall. And when I tell you that it sounded like I had just bought a new amp, like a new, new amp. Like I already had a new, but I had the JC5 for a few weeks before that. I knew what it sounded like in the system for the most part. I mean, it sounded like a different amp. I would have thought that it, I, you know, it, it, I can't even describe. It was night and day, night and day. And I was just like, wow. And it didn't occur to me why that was at the time. I didn't realize it was because of the, <laughs> the Panamax initially. I was listening to it. I'm like, whoa, what happened? Why would the wall make such a difference? I do have a dedicated 20 amp circuit back there to get more amperes, right? And I had it plugged into that. I'm like, wow. So I plugged it back into the Panamax when I started thinking about it. And yes, it sounded like the sound went from here to here. Like literally, here to here. And I was just like, wow. I have been listening like that for years, even on the old amp. Now it's possible, and I actually did try this out with my old amp. It wasn't as big of a difference with the old A21. Why? Because it doesn't have as much power, doesn't have as much amp, amperage. Um, but it was still different. It was noticeable though. So I'm just like, man, like that's just something I wouldn't even thought of. And I could have been listening to this thing for years, right? Plugged into there. Now the trade-off is plugging it into the wall. I do hear that buzzing sound a little bit. It's a lot more faint than it used to be in a different house and a different equipment. But you have to put your ear really close to the speaker, but it is there. So it's not noticeable when, you, when, when stuff is playing, but it's there. So that's the trade-off. It's always a trade-off. Um, there are things I can do with an electrician to have them kind of like filter out the, all of the power in the house, stuff like, or at least in the basement. The bigger stuff I can do, I know. Um, I don't have that yet, but for now, I get the, I get the great sound quality. I get that all the power it can do. Um, just have to deal with that trade-off. So that was an important lesson, a uh, really, very important lesson that again, changed the whole tone and the whole quality of the sound down here. So when you think about, you know, I said six months in, uh, I get why reviewers spend months and months with their, especially with the audio equipment. It takes that much time to have things break in and, you know, for you to just dial things in and figure out this, figure out that. These are the kind of things that happen. It reset every single time it happened. It reset my thinking and my evaluation of this whole stuff for the better, right? That's the good news. So everything was getting improved and I'm sure I have more to go. I'm still learning, still doing a lot more, right? So I feel like what I had set out to do, what I had hoped to get equipment wise and how the room I wanted the room to look and feel, everything I set out to do in this phase, I've done. Everything that I hope to get equipment wise, I've gotten. So in that regard, you know, another way to think about in game guys is if I did not change anything about my system or anything about this room, would I be satisfied? Yes. Yes. If I didn't change it to me, everything above this point or whether it's above or left or right, everything changing at this point is just purely nice to have. Nothing is essential. Nothing to me is going to give me a dramatic improvement or dramatic increase based on everything I know to date uh, in any in any particular way, right? So that's what in game means. Um, I'm good. I'm good, right? I don't need to do anything else. I'm good, right? That's the other way to think about it. Now, that said, you know, for the final thing to close out this video, um, there are, and I've thought about this, of course, in fact, my brain, even before I bought anything, I'm thinking ahead. Like, again, where would I go from this? What, what would I want to do? Well, it turns out that there are three particular components or three particular areas of my actual home theater system that could, may, may, may not be in game, right? And that I could see myself growing into uh, at some point.
Okay, and then there's a couple aspects of the room um, as well. There, of course, I could do some some stuff too as well. Again, not a need in, in my opinion, but a nice to have. So the first is the Blue Sound Note. Now I've talked about that before, and folks that know Blue Sound Note, it's a $599 device. Uh, it gets the high-res music streams into my system, does it great. There are very expensive streamers and DAX that you know that you can get um, that are five thousand, ten thousand, and up. And it's like, why? You know, part of the reason why I settled for the Blue Sound Note is because I am only outputting this as a digital pastor. Right, so I'm not using the DAC in, in the Blue Sound Note. I'm using the wonderful DAC that's in the Anthem AVM90, because that's what the Anthem AVM90 is really about, the improved sound quality, um, upgraded circuitry, the, the high, super high-end DAC and all that stuff. So I'm using that DAC. So I'm basically just passing this through. So if you, you know, it's like, I've asked this question, like, what would I get going with one of those super expensive, you know, streamers? If I'm just passing passing through zeros and ones to the anthem to do all the work, so to speak, um, and I didn't get a clear answer, so I was like, "Well, for now, I'll just get that." Now I'm hearing now that there may be some benefits to getting higher end streamers. One example that I just recently heard about, like a couple of months ago, at one of my dealers uh, in the area, because um, they had one, and I was like, "What is that?" You know, he was telling me the the Rose, right? So the Rose um, streamers are making a lot of noise in the audio file space. Um, and they have a nice, cool interface. Some of them have the video. You could watch YouTube on it and blah, blah, blah. Um, but they are pretty high-end streamers and pretty nice things. They're probably one of the best out there. So I am looking at that, you know, and I will be investigating more about what that can give me over this. But I do recognize, right, that there are streamers that can give me something better than this. And one way I tested that was by even just comparing disc from my Oppo 205, which, again, was another upgraded audio component, for audio playback and in music in particular, um, disc versus streaming, you know, and I can hear that the the disc give me something. There's a little bit of tinge of just compression and some sense of like distortion, I think, that I get with the Blue Sound Note, right, versus like the highest quality disc that I have, for example. Um, and I'm wondering if, you know, again, I've heard people say they have crazy, crazy streamers and they're like, you know, it sounds super, super amazing and you know, matching vinyl and matching CDs or better than CDs or whatever. So this, not just CDs, all this. So I'm curious about that, but I do recognize that that's probably area number one that I can look into at some point. And, you know, that wouldn't be a huge, huge thing, most likely, right, in terms of cost and all that stuff. And, you know, pretty easy to swap that out. Area number two, the TV. Now, TVs are always something that I've said you really don't get to an game because TVs change so much. Right, and not because of the picture quality necessarily, but all of the specs and all of the features around them. Things like HDMI versions matter. That matters. If you're, you know, HDMI version 2.1 versus 2.0 B and A and 1.4 before I any mean, like that stuff matters. So that stuff is always changing. Obviously, big stuff like the overall resolution. You got 4K, like the 8K. You know, when it was just 1080p, yeah, you know, you're missing some things, right? If you want to get higher, higher resolution and higher stuff like that. Now, TVs have ultimately been pretty stagnant, though, as of late. Um, you know, there's stuff that's happening under the hood to try to improve pitch quality, make everything everything going about brightness, brightness, brightness. I know that there's QD OLED now. There's MLA for LG OLED, and they'll continue to improve on that. But I've seen them all, guys. Like, at the end of the day, QD OLED is nice. It does look better in some regards. Most of the time, though, it's indistinguishable from the top-of-the-line LG OLEDs um, and or just top-of-the-line, like, you know, LG Display OLED, just to say the WRGB OLEDs. Um, again, not a grand thing. Again, that's kind of more of a lateral thing to me. But um, what what is better, you know, tangibly better is size. There's no sub substitute for size. So this is an 83, and it looks small on the camera, but it, it is pretty nice size down here for sure. The wall is made. You know, there's another tier of TVs that exist now. For affordable prices, actually, there are the 100, 100 inch, 100 inch tier TVs. And, you know, that kind of size could technically fit here, you right? And I think that that would absolutely be a, a great size to get a full cinematic experience down here. Nice to have. Again, if I didn't have to get anything bigger, I'll be fine. But there is another tier. Even four or five years ago, 100 inch um, would have been like twenty five, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 minimum. And now, like literally, guys, 
you can get a hundred inch TV for three grand. Three grand from, from Hisense. TLC has them for like four, four or five grand. I mean, it's crazy. So there are options out there. Now, yeah, I said OLED or die, right? So an OLED that's of the 100 inch tier, there's only one in existence and it is still like $25,000. It has been now for the last two years. Has it moved in price? <laughs> so I'll keep an eye on that. I mean, if something becomes affordable and again, makes sense, not just size, but ideally have some other meaningful improvements that I can take advantage of. Not saying I wouldn't consider it, and you know it would be nice, um, for, especially for gaming, God, and getting a full, you know, again, you're in projected territory at that point, you know, and again, for this space, that's probably the biggest I really can com comfortably fit here, um, but that would be awesome, that would be awesome. The ideal would be 8K 100 inch. That's the ideal, I'm just, you know, right, writing up a dream TV, that's the best of everything. Now, 8K, I know, isn't a whole lot of content, and, you know, it's not necessary, of course, but if you want to get something future proof, you want to get the best of best, 8K, you know, 100 inch or so, that's the ultimate, that's the dream, right? Um, so we'll see, that stuff that doesn't exist, that literally does not exist, the 8K 100 inch or 90 something inch OLED, um, yeah, <laughs> right? I'm not saying I'm not looking at it though, just to say. The third item in, uh, for the home equipment is, are the subwoofers. I started this channel early on back then. One of the first videos I did before I even had the channel was this SVS sub video. When I first got the SV16s and I was like, again, mind blown. Like I saw the specs, I saw the size, I saw the power, the amplifier. I'm like, and I saw the early, early reviews and was like, this is like the ultimate subwoofer. And it's like, well, would I really ever need something more than this? That was more of a question. I knew there were more expensive subs like JL Audio and stuff like that, but would I really need it? That was my question about the end game. Well, okay, I don't need it. Like I said, I don't need it. But I do recognize that there are, there is a tier above this. There are some movers out there that can put out more bass, more output, at even lower distortion, you know, and it can give you like a more visceral uh, feeling and experience than what the SV, SVS, SV16 Ultras can do. Um, I wouldn't say that it's a dramatic thing, but it's, there. Now in this space, I couldn't justify it because aesthetically, I love the size where, you know, how these fit in here. They fit perfectly in the spaces that I have them. And anything like that, I think would be appreciably better, would also be bigger, not to mention way more money, but would also be bigger, you know, and I don't necessarily want to get something that's bigger in this space. The other thing is I don't tax these subwoofers at all in this space. Like that's the truth. I don't. Um, I feel like like my, the subwoofer volume on on the actual subwoofer amps are at minus eighteen. You know, I see people putting videos where they usually have them at like minus ten or, or minus five or something. That's way overkill. Like at minus eighteen, with the way I have everything calibrated, what I've done in, with Anthem Arc and stuff, that's fine. It gives me the non boomy not overbearing bass when bass is needed is there. I can, I do, I have felt the flans, the pants flapping pressurization in my space. But it's not overbearing, and it's a nice balance for music and for movies. I'm good. I'm I'm actually really happy after a lot of effort that I've kind of got the bass somewhat dialed in from my main listening position, especially. And these simple for do a fine job of that. Now, there's something else that can can give me a more like whoa feeling. You know, we're watching a movie, hearing the T-Rex drop or whatever. Yes, I recognize that there are there are things out there. And there are speak, um, subwoofers out there. Again, when I ask myself, where do I go from here? I have a valid answer with SVS, right? I can go to Perlisten, some of the higher-end Perlisten stuff, or consider some of the best subwoofers out there. I personally love them. I've heard them. I've seen them. They look great. They are super expensive. And again, they are bigger, but they're great. JL Audio is renowned. Every time I hear JL Audio, I'm blown away. It does something that I've never heard of these SVSs do in my, in my space. Whether that's a room thing or not, I don't know. But I've heard them multiple times. They blow me away every time. There is a level above these, I recognize. But do I need it? No. But if I if the opportunity presents itself, again, if I go to another space that is a more dedicated, true, like rectangular shape home theater, I would be looking to that. I wouldn't be actually be looking to necessarily replacing these. I would be looking to add to them. Because ideally, Endgame would have would be four subwoofers. Not to flex, but as you got, you know, four subwoofers in the corners to get the most even distribution of base in your space. I can't really do that in this space, despite the way this space is designed, and that's fine. 
But you know, if I had a dedicated room, I'm looking maybe just to add to. I'll still keep these around. These still are great and put them, you know, in the, in the corners and be good, right? So think it ahead, but we'll see. Keep that in mind. So and I've reached my end game. Like I said, based on the fact that I've achieved everything that I set out to do in this space, I would say yes. Am I truly satisfied? Truly satisfied? You know, that's, that's a loaded question, right? Truly satisfied. And I say that because I'm still learning, right? I gave the examples of what my mind was at 20 years ago, 15 years ago, 10 years ago. It was very different. And I'm sure five years from now, I might, it might be very different. You know, I would say that the core pieces, the things that don't change often, speakers, the amp, I think I'm good with these for a while, right? You know, and again, I'm not someone that just goes and throws money to upgrade just to upgrade. So before I see something where I'm like, it makes sense for me to get some, some you know, bigger, beefier, more expensive amp than, than this or change my speakers, it would have to be something like really, really noticeable. And it probably would just be more of I'm in a different room, different space, that kind of thing. I think I'm good for those things. That's what I mean. TVs, again, always evolve. Um, you know, I'm not, I don't see myself necessarily having a TV 10 years from now because it would be really outdated by that point. But, you know, again, it makes sense in a guest room, but not for my main space. That's what I mean. Um, so we'll see. But this is what I set out for. This was the dream. I'm living it. Now is just time to enjoy it. Um, as I saying right now, I am truly satisfied. Um, but, you know, in the hobby, I'm still looking, like I said, still thinking ahead and seeing what I can do to always maximize the system, of course, right? But um, channel is still going, and I'm going to keep showing some stuff. So, you know, in that regard, we're going to keep it moving. True Techno Gamer here. Thanks so much for all of your support, your love, your watching my videos, your comments, your reviews. Channel has grown a lot this year, so I appreciate it. And let's keep it going. Hopefully, I can still give you guys more content that you guys enjoy. So, till the next one. Happy holidays, happy new year, and I will talk to you soon. Thanks.